Today, perhaps we really will talk about what being complacent, covetous, and content, or even grateful, says about evil. Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. We began the conversation on the last episode, which I would encourage you to go find at uh, barrycreamer.com. And uh, you can look up all the episodes there. But if you didn't hear the one before this, you will miss a lot of the setup that I think uh, will explain why I use some of the terms that I do. So I would encourage you to do that. We talked about the problem of evil in general, which I have taught at every university that I've been at. And it's impossible to cover it in a brief session. I mean, this is the kind of thing I would teach at Criswell College, where I serve as the president right now. I would teach it in a class about either ethics or philosophy of religion or philosophy in general, just the nature of the existence of God and so on, because it's such a prominent topic in so many people's minds. So there's a lot of reason to discuss the issue. But what we did last time was just talk about how uh, there's a trilemma that exists between God's omnipotence, his goodness, and yet the existence of evil and how those three things could coexist at the same time creates this conundrum uh, that people address in different ways. We went through the different ways to address that during the last conversation, but we went through the ways to address it uh, intellectually. And at the very end of that conversation, I mentioned that the most dogged problem is the one that's personal and psychological and experiential and emotional not the purely intellectual and rational problem. Regardless of what field you put that intellectual endeavor into, it's not the same as when an issue comes to you personally and you experience it in your own encounter with suffering. It changes things. And I gave you a couple of examples of things you could look at uh, to follow up on that. So that's that other episode. But today, what I want to talk about is the journey that I've seen people take. And and I, I don't just mean by that that I've watched an individual go through all four of these stages. I mean that I'm constantly seeing different people in each of these four stages of dealing with evil. Now, there are plenty of people I'm around, so don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, like when a psychologist walks in the room and everybody gets a little self-conscious. I'm not doing that. Uh, my producer, Daisy, she's a, she's a counselor now. So now everybody's super cautious about the words they say around her. How, what's she going to read into that? Which, of course, she doesn't do. So sometimes you might think that about a theologian, a philosopher, or whatever, that I'm, that I'm trying to evaluate people to see where they are on the scale of how they're evaluating evil right now. But there are, when people are actually dealing with suffering in their life, when they're actually being confronted by evil and suffering in the world in their personal lives, then you, ha- you have to do something with it, something. And so you'll see the breadth of the range that's available here as we talk through each of these four words, because the way I've parsed it out, these are the different responses that I see people giving. And, and one of them is first, and, and this is just the first one, and it's, you know, I, I, so I'm not, I'm not saying this to be insulting to anyone. It I, I, I can't think of a word to use that's not slightly insulting here, uh, but it, when I say the word, so I'm going to say the word shallow, okay? But I don't mean the person, but I mean sort of in the shallow end of the pool. When you first put your feet in the water and you're just ad- adjusting to the temperature, the shock, you know, the people can tell you, oh, I swim with the polar bears. Ooh, well, that, that looks cold, but, I, but I'm watching on TV. I'm not going to swim with the polar bear club. You know what I'm talking about. Those people that jump in the water when there's ice on the water, it's insane. I had a good friend who did it. I remember him doing it. He was the candy man at our church when I was growing up, and he had a pool, and he swam every day of the year, including breaking up the ice and swimming through the ice in his own pool. Had a picture of him in the newspaper one time, the Arlington Citizens Journal. 
anyway, it's been a long time since the Citizen Journal was out. Um, anyway, the, the point is that I don't, I don't swim with the Polar Bear Club. So I don't experience what it is for water to really be cold. When you put your feet into really cold water, it transforms your thinking about what those people are going through. It is agonizing. And so when I say shallow, that's what I'm referring to, not to people. This is sort of the shallow end response to evil. When you first encounter it, some people, and, I, and I'm, I'll admit, I think some people may not even go through this stage, but some people get here and some people stay here. Like, like I'm never going above my shins in the water. This is it. I'm not going any further. And all that means is it doesn't mean the evil's not going to go further. It doesn't mean the suffering's not deep. It just means they're not willing to expose any more of their psyche to it. That like this, this is as far as it goes for me. And this is the idea of complacency. And this is, and you know what I mean by a complacent person. Oh, everything's okay. I don't need anything else. I don't want anything else. And I'm not going to do anything about it because there's nothing really to be done about it. And one example of this kind of, and this is sort of a complacent example, one of the complacency cases that I would give an example of is a sort of childlike or Pollyanna-ish myopia about the world. Yeah, I don't want to talk about all that suffering over there. Come on, we have a birthday party to go to, that kind of thing. Now, obviously, I'm exaggerating, using hyperbole to describe the situation, but it's not far from what I have seen happen uh, with some people who are encountering the reality of evil and suffering in the world for the first time. It's sort of a, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, the three monkeys kind of image. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to, I don't, so I don't want to talk about it. If we just avoid the conversation altogether, then we can stay focused on the things that are nearer to home that are a little more comfortable for us. And that's why we make the world around us comfortable. That's where we want to be. Hence the word myopia that I was using a moment ago. So uh, there, but that, you know, where you would say, well, nobody's going to stay there. I mean, that's just so immature. Who would do that? It's actually a lot more compelling psychologically than we'd like to think it is. Uh, and I think it shows up, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to swing so vaguely and so broadly that this is meaningless, but I do get that this is a very wide, uh, you know, uh, there's a huge circumference to the circle I'm, I'm describing right now, that I'm circumscribing right now. But, but I do think it is one circle, and, and it, would be, it would be the evidence of this, and a person that, that I'm saying is complacent. It's this practice that we have in some cases, even in the case of grief, that we have of just denying it. You know, just, just I, I'm, not, I'm not going to confront it. It didn't happen. Uh, my husband hasn't actually divorced me, or my wife didn't actually leave me, or my relative's not actually dead, or I don't want to talk about it, or I'm not willing to go to the funeral, or whatever it is that, that, and I don't know what all the expressions of denial would be, but I know because I've experienced it in my own life in ways that after a couple of weeks of sort of living in denial about something that really shook my world when I was a young man, uh, I had no idea that I had just shut down that part of my mind, that I had not, uh, I had acted as if that memory didn't exist, that it wasn't there for just a, a couple of weeks. And then people started to confront me with it and say, hey, you know, what are you going to do about this? What's going to happen with it? And, and it's, it, it's like I was coming out of a stupor that I had to recognize it again. So I, I don't know what that's like for everybody. I, I, I'm not trying to prescribe anything. I'm, not, I'm certainly not a counselor. I'm simply saying a lot of people live that way day to day in a world where there is evil and suffering where we know that there's constant evil and suffering, and yet we speak as if we can just avoid thinking about it, then it won't really be there. And, what, and I think what's going on with us is, and it's the same thing that happens with legitimate psychological denial, that we just don't want to rock the boat as long as we're still able to stand in it. it, it it's sort of like, even if you know it's not really the best, uh, you know, the devil you know kind of expression, that expression. We, we just don't want to rock the boat if we're able to stand in it. We don't want to risk the tolerable comfort that we have. It's, hey, the world's not perfect. I wish it was better, but it's, but it's better than it would be if I took this risk and exposed my psyche or myself in some other way to this inscrutable misery. Inscrutable meaning I, I can't even comprehend what it might turn into. I just don't know. I'm not going to take that risk and give up the tolerable comfort that I have right now. So there's a sense of complacency that we have a lot of times, and, and, I'm, and I mean even as believers. 
uh, where we just don't think about the evil that's going on in the world around us. We just don't, we just don't process it. So we're complacent. Hey, the world's good enough. I don't need to do that. I don't need to get involved in that. I don't need to go participate in this part of the world or that part of the world because my world's good enough. I'm standing up in the boat. Don't rock the boat. It's okay. Okay, you get the idea. Clearly, I'm implying complacency is not a good place to stay. Uh, and that's true. But whether it's a good place or not, I'm, I want to describe these four attributes to you or these four uh, different dispositions regarding evil. And along with it, along the way, be saying, hopefully we will grow from one to the next as we go along. I'm not really prescribing how to grow in it as much as just describing the states today. And then I think they carry with them their own prescription, I hope. Uh, So you'll see. So the second step, I would say, the second uh, part of the journey that I've seen some people go through is to arrive at discontentment. And I'm, gonna, and I'm going to do this now to attach the word covetousness to this as well, because discontentment and covetousness very often mean exactly the same thing to us. Uh, in fact, there's a way to talk about gratitude in Scripture that basically makes that, you know, that last commandment, thou shalt not covet all of these different things. They simply mean be, be, be content with what you have. If you're not content with what you have, there's something wrong with you, not wrong with the world, right? So covetousness and discontentment kind of go hand in hand in our way of thinking about the fallen world. There is a distinction to be made in this case regarding evil in the world, and I'll describe that for you at the end of this part of the conversation about discontentment. So when I'm talking about a person coming to an attitude of discontentment about evil and suffering in the world, it's the attitude that you see in Israel, for instance, in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, in these pleading, longing prayers for God to deliver them. In the 10th Psalm, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? This is not a person who's complacent with the world. Oh, well, it's good enough. I guess God took care of us. This is all right. This is a person who is not content with the way the world is. God, why aren't you doing something about this? And, and you know, it's important for us to remember these are not people who, you know, have to drive a sedan instead of a pickup if they wanted a pickup. We're talking about people whose homes were sacked and whose families were slaughtered before their eyes. It is as evil an environment and a world as you can possibly imagine. And so they lift up their eyes to God and say, why, Lord, are you standing so far away? Why? Are you hiding yourself in these times of trouble? If you, if you skip from there down to the, to the 80th Psalm, you hear the same kinds of pleas. And I want to bring this one up because it's such a typical statement of this prayer. Oh, Lord God of hosts. And again, these prayers permeate Scripture. They're not occasional. They permeate Scripture. The attitude that I'm conveying doesn't just show up in the 10th Psalm and then the 80th Psalm. It's everywhere in the Psalms. And in this case, in Psalm 80, it's just so clear. O Lord of hosts, Lord God of hosts, the armies, how long will you be angry with us, your people? How long are you going to be angry with your people? How long are you going to put us off? How long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You've given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors, and our enemies are laughing among themselves. Uh, When you carry this into the prophets, it's the same way. Habakkuk, the whole book of Habakkuk deals with this. In fact, if I have time, I'll come back to Habakkuk in the other examples for the other parts of the experience we have with evil and suffering, because Habakkuk is very much a book written about how we're supposed to arrive, where we're supposed to arrive in our thinking and relationship with God when we've really encountered the evil. And so it starts in the very first chapter when Habakkuk is crying out on behalf of the people, oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you won't hear. Or how long will I cry to you? Violence, but you won't save. Why do you make me see iniquity? And then why do you idly look at the wrong? In other words, you're showing me that it's evil, and then you're not paying attention to it. Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forth. The wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth twisted. This is a, a plea 
from the people of Israel through the mouth of Habakkuk. To say to God, this is not good enough, that's discontentment. And I've met people with that demeanor toward the world. And very often, their their arrival at this phase, at this state, where they're finally discontented with the world, is something of a crisis of faith for them. It's the first opportunity they've had to encounter this, so they don't know what else to do with it, and they think, maybe I don't really have faith. And what I'm always trying to convey to them is, oh, this has nothing to do with saying you don't have faith. This has to do with finally discovering why you need faith. And, and, and I'm not going to pretend at all that your faith can handle this yet, but you didn't even really need the faith you had until now. Now we need to talk about this. Uh, The same thing, by the way, carries into the New Testament. If you say to yourself, oh, well, this is, those are Old Testament examples. Jesus has come. We shouldn't have this kind of discontentment in the new world. And I know the Philippians 4 passage. We'll get to it in a minute. When you say, no, we shouldn't have this, but we have to go through this or we will never arrive where we're supposed to be. And in the church, this is what's being expressed uh, like even at the ascension of Jesus, so in Acts chapter 1, when they had come together, so they, you know, they, Jesus has already risen, he's appeared to them, he's spent a, a bunch of days with them, he's about to leave, and when they come together, they say to him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's the discontented question. That is the question. When are you going to restore the kingdom? Is it going to finally happen? Are you finally going to pay attention? to the suffering of your people. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive, and he gives them something else. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the the end of the earth. In James 4, exactly the same thing is communicated, and I quote this one all the time because it makes the point so obviously, and it's clearly after the resurrection. It's in the New Testament church. In James 4, James says, do you not know that it being a friend of this world is being at enmity with God? That's how broken the world is. If you are a friend of the world, you are inherently at odds with God. Something's broken, something's wrong. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So if you are complacent in the world, oh, well, this world's fine with me. Let's just make things happen and be content to that's not good enough. God expects us to have a sense of the enmity between his order and the things he wants and the way the world is right now. Now, after the resurrection, I'm talking about. And so he goes on in verse 5 and says, this is in James 4, verse 5, or do you suppose it's no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us, but he gives grace too. So there's this desiring that God has that creates an an earnest burning and desire in us for what's not in the world, and yet he gives more grace. And that's why it says God opposes the proud. Oh, I've got everything I need. But gives grace to the humble. Lord, how long? How long? So he says in verse 7, therefore submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Listen, this is the part that concludes the point. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. That's all of that expression. Now, what he says after that is leading up to, and I'll read you more of this in a minute from the next chapter. He really makes the point. But you know how he concludes that verse by saying, and he will exalt you. But the he will exalt you comes in his time, and it comes later. And what he's saying to us now is humble yourselves before the Lord. Humbling yourself before the Lord is not just the humbling yourselves among one another. It's It's lowering ourselves before God enough to recognize the condition of the world in which we actually live and the sorrow, the longing, the desire that should accompany accompany our presence in that world. So in the process that we go through, one step is just acknowledging the tension between the way we wish things were, the way we know things should have been if the creation hadn't fallen, and the way we know they are if we're honest. That's the thing, if we're honest. And an adequate solution to that 
to the tension is to try to ease ourselves, comfort ourselves by stealing from other people. So this world's broken. I don't have enough stuff, so I'm going to take it from you. I'm going to be more successful than you. I'm going to win over you. And we make our life comfortable and ignore the suffering of others. But the point in the New Testament is that we're, you know, we're to take on the suffering of others. We're to see where others suffer and care about what they're going through. Quite the opposite of that. But also this, though, this is important. We're not commanded to take that position just so we'll continue to mourn. (laughs) It's not, you know, he never says just mourn and you're going to be miserable and you're going to die that way. Regardless of how long it takes, and maybe it is after this life that we receive it. It's not always, but maybe it is. He always has that other statement. Because we're humbled with him, because we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. Because we humble ourselves before him, he also exalts us, just like he does Christ. The Father exalts Christ in his submission. So you get the idea. The difference between discontentment and covetousness is what I want to mention here real quickly, because normally if I were saying, you know, believers need to be discontent, that's a problematic statement because we're commanded to be content. You know, I've learned to be content in whatever state I am, Paul says. The difference here between discontentment that I'm talking about now and covetousness I want something, you know, that's not rightfully mine, is that we were created for peace. We were created for blessings. It is right for us to long for perfection, even when we cannot obtain it in this world. That is, the fact that we cannot obtain perfection in the fallen world does not mean that we shouldn't seek it. Our, in in other words, in the common expression that's used, our reach really should exceed our grasp. That's the idea. So uh, all that said, you get the idea of the state, and surely you've met people that are in this state, the discontent state. Well, the world's broken, I can't see. And and really, honestly, the people who are struggling the most with the theodicy, that trilemma that I was describing for you in the last episode, those are people who, in the, who are, if they're struggling with it, I'm saying, those are the people who are in this state of discontentment. And again, that's a step forward from the state where we just don't want to acknowledge that there's even any evil in the world. So I, so that's not a condemnatory statement. I'm just saying that's where we would be. The next step, the one we need to take after that, is so important. That step is contentment. And, and again, I'm, I'm saying these as if I watch individuals take one step to the next. Obviously, this, this happens over a long period of time in an individual's life, if at all, I'm just describing how I've seen it in different people at different times, and I don't know how it came to pass. I'm not trying to describe a psychological development of each of these phases in human experience. I'm not doing that. I'm just telling you, in my experience over my six decades of life, five of which have been mostly conscious, uh, because, you know, I was a kid, and kids don't know anything. Sorry, kids. Just saying that's the truth. So the reality is, though, over those five decades of conscious awareness of what's going on in the world, I've seen all of these different states. One of those states is a state of contentment. Uh, and this, and we see this in the Old Testament people of God as well. So, I, I mean, I'm not just describing it psychologically, but the reality is in Scripture. These are, these are described. So the Old Testament people of God experience contentment when they know this. So in Habakkuk, he models this for the people of Israel. In his encounter with God, remember, we were just reading the section where he's lamenting that God is showing him evil so that Habakkuk will see it, and then God's not doing anything about it. And he, he says, what are you doing? The law is not doing any good. It's paralyzed. Why, why are you not bringing justice to our streets and so on? So that discontentment, though, gives way in the second chapter to his contentment at what God says to him. So in Habakkuk 2, the statement is, and the Lord Yahweh answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets. So he may run who reads it, meaning convey the message to others. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, and it does, why is it taking so long? We always pray, right? If it seems slow, wait for it. This is Habakkuk 2. Wait for it. (laughs) That's what it says. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And then that verse you'll recognize. As soon as I say it, you'll recognize it's quoted three times in the New Testament. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous 
shall live by his faith. See, there is a there is a response to the evil in the world that puffs us up. Either says, "Oh, I don't see the evil in the world. I'm I'm fine. Everything's good. I there's no the Pollyanna-ish kind of complacent approach." There's a puffed up response that says, I'm discontent, this world stinks, and I'm going to take things from other people, and he who dies with the most toys wins. There's that discontented sort of response. But then there's the response of faith that says, and this is the point of having faith, that we look at the world honestly and we recognize how terrible it is, how how broken it is, how much suffering there is in it. And we have faith to wait for the deliverance we know Is coming. And in that actual faith, not in the pretense that something will happen in the future that's not happening right now, but in the present experience of faith, we actually find comfort, contentment, the ability to believe. This is what Paul's talking about in Philippians 4. Uh, when he's saying, look, I and and he's writing to a church that's given money to him because he's imprisoned and he needed help. And he says, oh, thanks for sending the help. You've helped me even when nobody else did. And then he says, but but not that I'm speaking in need in in terms of being in need, because I have learned in whatsoever situation I am to be content. This is not Paul saying, hey, prison's fine. He knows there is suffering in prison. He knows the world is messed up while that suffering is taking place in prison for people who are right, who are trying to represent the Holy Spirit's presence in the world. He knows that's wrong, but he also knows how to be content in that situation because he believes God will make things right. And so in his faith, he is presently comforted and finding contentment. Here's how he says it. Not that I'm speaking uh, of being in need, because I've learned in whatsoever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound, In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all of those different things through him who strengthens me. What was the secret of being able to face plenty or hunger, abundance or need and still have satisfaction? That he finds his contentment in Christ. The very thing he tells us at the beginning of that chapter when he's telling us to rejoice always because the Lord is at hand. In James, it comes down to this. Remember, I was reading to you James earlier in James 4 when we were talking about the discontentment we have. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. But the next chapter, you know, after it says, so be humble, the Lord will exalt you. In the next chapter, when he's dealing with people who themselves have been suffering because their wages have been stolen by people who are wealthy and they're holding out their wages. Well, I'll give you the money later. You go home and be hungry and be cold, but it'll be okay because I'll pay you later. He's dealing with those wealthy people who are cheating their workers and the workers who are dissatisfied because they're being cheated. And he says to them, be patient, therefore, brothers under the coming of the Lord. And then he uses the very, the, the illustration that he gives, the metaphor he gives, is the very field where they've been working all day and they never got their wages, you know? So I worked in the field all day and I got nothing. And he's using that as a metaphor for what every person in the world encounters if they deal honestly with the world around them. That you work and work and toil and sow and you don't get back everything you put into it. It's what it means for the world to be broken. And so listen to how he says it to these guys. He says, be patient, therefore, brothers, under the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and then the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts because the coming of Yahweh, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So you you don't find satisfaction by putting down others. You don't find satisfaction by taking from others. You find contentment by knowing that the Lord will make it right. And in our faith that he knows what he's doing, that the early rains will come, the latter rains will come, the Lord will make it right. We find contentment. So the the third step we're taking is contentment. So we start with complacency. Eh, you know, who cares? They're suffering over there. I'm fine. We move to a state of discontentment. They're suffering. My little encounter with suffering is making me recognize how much I'm, how much more I should have cared about them, but it's also making me question, what's going on here? Lord, how long? But then my faith kicks in, and I say, 
oh, Lord, will you make this right? And he says, yes, I will. Read about it in my book. See it in the examples I've given in the past. I will make it right. Trust me, believe in me, find contentment. But then finally, it turns to, and this one's almost incomprehensible to us. And, and even, even as I explain it, I'm not going to pretend I've arrived at this yet. Uh, I, I want to. I, I want to get there. That's why I say yet, not like I can predict when I'm going to get there. I want to be there. But it is thankfulness, thankfulness itself. Uh, this is what shows up in the Old Testament story that I was telling you about Habakkuk. When in the first chapter, it's lamentation and sorrow and grief and discontentment, but they recognize it at least. In the second chapter, it's have faith. E even though it takes a long time, wait for it. Believe me, it will come. Have faith. The righteous shall live by his faith. But in the third chapter, at the very end of the chapter, he says this, starting in verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, even, he's saying, even if everything in the world remains broken, if the stuff that you're used to working doesn't work. So, and, and, and he's not saying this because he's threatening them or it's not going to work. This is not a prophecy like that. This is like the statement, if your father and your mother forsake you. He, so he's giving this conditional that says, if the most unimaginable things in your world were to take place, it still would not be the case that this promise would be broken. I am going to do this no matter what. So hear it that way. So here's what he says. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, and the produce of the olive itself fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there's no herd in the stalls. Yet, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. It's very much Job, right? Even if he kills me, I will praise him, thank him. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. The Old Testament people of God learned this transition that we're to make to being grateful. The way that's expressed in the New Testament is the command, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I, I, you know, I know we can try to explain that away and say giving thanks is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is. That's fine. But I mean, the context and other passages that teach the same lesson make it clear that he's saying, in fact, the, the one in Ephesians is this statement, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost impossible to conceive of that. There are things for which you just can't give thanks. They're not thankable things, you know, however you want to describe it. It just would not make sense to give thanks for them. How could that possibly be? And the transition happens, and I, I believe this. I've, I've seen it in other people, and I believe it intellectually, and I have committed to it intellectually. I say the words, I say them to the Lord, and I mean them, but my psychology is not there yet. I'm working on it. I'm trying to bend my you know, worldly existence to the spiritual reality that I live in because of my faith. And that is, you know, we can be thankful when we recognize that things are not happening accidentally. When we start seeing the world a different way than we see it by our nature. The, the way we see our, and by our nature, I mean as Westerners. I don't mean our human nature. I mean our Western human nature, and, and more specifically, I mean American human nature. But this is transatlantic. It's not just American. As Westerners, we're empiricists. You know, we experience things in the world, and we derive our conclusions about what's true in the world based on our experiences. And so we have a hard time conceiving of the world beyond that. Whatever we've seen, whatever we've proven, you know, show me. We have a whole state whose motto, show me. You know, they're the show me state. Uh, it is very much this skeptical, if I can use science to demonstrate it, then I'll believe it. If I can't, then I won't, uh, kind of view of the world. And it makes sense because that's what makes air conditioners work and airplanes fly, as I always say. Yeah, and we're grateful for both of those. So I'm, I, I get that. That's the natural way that we see the world. And it's so powerful 
that we want to extend it into everything that we see in the world. And so we become empiricists, and not just that, but deists. And by a deist, I mean a person who believes, yeah, there's a God, and he created everything, but then he just left it running to its own, under its own laws, you know? So it's like a clockmaker. He set the clock running, and uh, the evidence that there's a God is purely in how well the clock works, right? So you say, well, I would never be a deist. That's a ridiculous perspective on the world. But the way we think of the world is deistic. We think of the world as existing in this moment because it existed a moment ago. We don't think of God creating the world every moment. We just can't think of the world that way. I don't mean we can't conceive of it intellectually. I mean, you're never going to wake up and you're never going to be in the middle of an intersection with your car stalled and think to yourself, well, let's pray for the car to get out of the middle of the intersection. I mean, you're going to be turning the key and making phone calls and doing everything you can. And that's normal. I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. I think you should turn the key before you start praying. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't mind that. That's good. But the way a believer is supposed to see the world, I mean, just think about the language in Colossians 1. We, we quote this all the time because it's such an easy illustration of it, but it's present everywhere in Scripture, everywhere. That, that the world doesn't exist for a single moment without God willing every detail of it. So in Colossians 1, the wording is, for by him all things were created, so he's the source, the origin, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and in the end, they're going to be for him. They are going to return to his glory in some way or another. So all things were created through him and for him. But next verse, 17. And he is before all things, so he's the preeminence. And in him, all things hold together. Nothing would be what it is this moment if God did not specifically will it. I always have to insert here. Maybe it's just me personally. Maybe I'm overly defensive about it. But I always have to insert here. I'm not even a Calvinist. If you don't know what it is, that's fine. I'm not saying it pejoratively, insultingly, or trying to be too short about it or create a straw man or a caricature of the theology and belief, the doctrines of grace. I'm all for you, happy for you to believe it. I just don't. I'm not, I don't believe that. I'm not a determinist and I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not a reformed thinker. I believe in a legitimately countercausal free will in man, but I believe God creates that every single moment. I have it this moment because God is giving it to me this moment, and I wouldn't have it otherwise. That's how I believe the world exists in Scripture. For me to bring that into the real world would be for me to acknowledge, not that something tragic is happening in the world right now, and I need God to get back involved in the world. You know, this is the prayer that we talked about when we're discontent. God, where are you? Why are you sleeping? Why do you not come? It's not an immature prayer. It is the desire and longing of a person who's opened their eyes to be honest about the condition of the world. But it's also not a fully mature prayer. Because as we mature in our understanding of God's presence in the world, we learn that a miracle isn't God suddenly getting involved in the world again. What we would refer to as a miracle is just God doing something surprising. Because God getting involved in the world would be implying that he didn't give you this breath that you're drawing right now. But he did. And he's the only one who made it effective for your body. Every single, th every sunrise is the miraculous activity of God in the world. And if we saw the world that way, if we thought of the world that way, then instead of thinking, oh, this terrible disease is afflicting this person because of nature's machinery that's just running itself outside the will of God altogether, God, please get back involved in the world and put your hand in the world. Now, look, there's a whole long conversation to be had here about the doctrine of means and understanding how these things take place, and yet God is not the cause of evil. And literally, it says he's not the author of confusion, for instance, and that he doesn't sin and that he can't lie and things like that. I believe all of that, and I believe it is compatible with this reality that no matter what's going on in the world, God hasn't turned his back on it. He's not ignoring it. He's not uninvolved in it. He knows exactly what's going on and exactly how to address it every single moment. And so when we pray for his intervention in our perception of his involvement in the world, we're actually just praying for him to do something in a world in which he's fully involved already, which allows us then to bow before him and say, Lord, thank you 
that the world you've created here, that we've made such a mess of, that sin has made such a mess of, that my own decisions have made such a mess of, that nature seems to do so many terrible things in, that you are actively involved in this world for a reason. And for that, I can give you thanks. It's the real idea, you know, behind Romans 8, 28, which I won't go into now. So, I, look, I, I just want to make a point about how if we acknowledge these things that this would be a progression of ways of thinking about evil and suffering in the world to go from complacency to discontentment, finally to contentment, and then ultimately to thanksgiving. I, and, I, and again, I'm not even pretending that I am close to thanksgiving. I want to get there, and I want to practice it, but I'm saying it's that, that far down the road. So I'm not saying that's easy. But in talking about how we arrive at all those things, I want to talk about what that would mean in terms of our response to the individuals we're dealing with in order to wrap up the conversation. So our response is most often only going to be important when it's pastoral. I don't mean you have to be a pastor, but I mean when we are shepherding someone, when we're comforting someone, when we're nourishing someone who's facing a personal crisis in evil and suffering. And so I just want to give these steps really quickly, and this is just a con- these are concluding comments. Number one is to be observant, to, to observe where we and others actually are, so that if, if something bad is happening in my life, not to pretend it's not happening, but to acknowledge it, and more importantly, to open my eyes and see when something bad is happening in others' lives. And I think this is a huge part of what has changed for me over the last 10 years or so, where I have been more concerned, more compassionate about people in different parts of our culture and society whose pleas for help I had ignored before and am finally recognizing are real and need to be heard. And so just opening our eyes to see where both we and others are is number one. Number two is to sit there with them, not try to solve the problem, not pretend I've got the answer. I'm going to rush in and deliver you from the pain you're experiencing. Uh, You know, in trite ways, this would be the person who walks into the hospital and says to someone who just lost their parent, uh, well, he's in a better place now, so you know it's all okay. That's, you know, I'm going to fix the problem. And I'm not saying people say it that glibly. Uh, But, you know, that trying to fix the problem is not always the fix to the problem, right? And so in chaplaincy ministry, one of the things you learn is the it's called the ministry of presence. It's it's really simple. Just be there. Just make sure they know they're not alone, that, that there is someone who is aware of the misery that's happening right now. You'd be surprised how meaningful that presence is in people's lives. And if you don't, and if you think, well, that sounds mighty uh, secular of you there, I was just saying, man, you know, the whole nature of Jesus' incarnation is him being present with us and then literally purchasing our redemption. So our call to be like him, we can't literally purchase people's redemption, is very much a call to be present with people in their suffering. So anyway, the second thing is just to sit there with them, to to practice the ministry of presence. And then finally, after we earn the right to speak, you know, in the fact that we've experienced something similar, so your testimony, uh, after you've spent so much time with them that they realize you're not just there to hit them with the truth and then bang out the door, but instead you've given them your time. Uh, Maybe they actually request it. That is an indication that you've earned the right now to speak, maybe if they request it, then help them toward the next step, whatever that next step would be. If they're glib about it, helping them to take it seriously. If they're taking it seriously, helping them to move toward faith. If they have faith but are just worn down to help them remember the sovereignty of God and the thankfulness we can have in every situation, you know, whatever that is. So remembering, so, and, and these are the things that I would put in that context and then I'm done. Just three things to remember. Number one, everybody's going to handle these things. Everybody has to, because evil is everywhere in the world. Suffering is everywhere in the world. There's nowhere to go that it's not. Uh, You know, you you could be Gautama Siddhartha, the the Buddha, 
and in your early life, your parents shielding you from all of the evil and suffering. But when you go out in the world, you're going to you're going to see it, and you're going to have to deal with it, which is sort of the foundation, you know, that, that came with Buddhism. So number one is just to remember that everybody's going to handle these issues somehow. The question is not whether we face and deal with suffering. The question is how we face and deal with suffering. So saying to someone, well, this will go away, it'll all be okay, is not necessarily the answer. Dealing with the reality. So remember that everybody's going to have to handle these things somehow. So not to be afraid. When somebody says, what do I do about the problem of evil and suffering? You say, oh, finally, you've joined the club. This is the question we're dealing with in the world. It's why Christ brought us his presence in the world. Number two, remember that no one is going to handle these things perfectly. No one. That's why we have both faith and hope. Faith that something will come that's not here. That means we're not handling it perfectly. Hope that something will someday be better, which means we're not handling it perfectly. So remember, no one, even those who are practicing faith and hope in reality, are not going to handle these things perfectly. But remember, most importantly, this last last thing, third thing to remember, that God is also fully aware. He is paying attention. God also does care, and he will respond. And we know, we know he will respond because he already did by joining with us in our suffering in his son's incarnation, in his son's temptation, in his son's rejection, and his death. But we also know that his response will one day be completed, that the evil will go away, the suffering will end because of his resurrection. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at berrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.